Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Ludnap Gaming. Today we're going to talk about fleet management for Star Citizen and how to build the perfect fleet for you. So last summer I put out a video about fleet management, which had a lot more to do with how to acquire ships and concierge status. This time around, we're going to focus more on ships you should be buying, how many ships you should be buying, and so on. Let's be clear about the obvious here first. Everyone has a different opinion on this, and I'm merely presenting you things to think about in forming your own. I'm also presenting you this information for two games simultaneously, Star Citizen and Star Citizen. No, that isn't an echo, but rather I want you to start thinking about your fleet for Star Citizen today and for Star Citizen, the released game. Here's why this is important. These are two different games. One is theoretical and vastly different from anything you've ever otherwise played. The other exists as we speak and has radically different considerations to entertain. This week we're going to focus on fleets built for the current game. Next week we're going to talk about your future fleet while introducing a new giveaway and how to pull all these strings together to achieve that perfect fleet. It's just too much to cover in one video. We still have to cover some ground about the future first. Star Citizen is a big promise for gameplay that is different from everything we already have. This goes beyond the technical promises of full persistence and so forth. We're talking about a game that aims to deliver a one-to-one -one life in space. We're talking about a game that is going to require you to maintain your fleet to the point of paying a crew, feeding them, housing them, and so on. The catch, however, is these are goals, dreams, eventual destinations. This is not the game we have today. It's a super easy trap to fall into now as well, because the fleet you build today isn't like the fleet you'll be building in, say, EVE Online today. Instead, right now in Star Citizen, if you're putting a fleet together, you're most likely thinking about it as how to set yourself up for the best possible launch come release. You're probably thinking to yourself, if you could get that Polaris in the hangar, it's really going to give you some oomph and some fights. You're going to have to pick up a Vulcan to do repairs and, well, a mole to mine up some starting cash. Everyone needs a dogfighter, a cutty blue to do a little bit of bounty hunting, and who doesn't want a Kraken while we're at it? Stop. Do you know what it's going to take to run a Kraken? When are you going to bounty hunt if you're busy mining? Ah, now you're probably thinking I'm off my rocker because lead. I already do bounty hunting missions and mine and do org dogfights and wander Cleo in a rover for my Carrick. So do I. This is the Star Citizen of today. That's my point. We have to understand that the future Star Citizen is going to be different. The impracticalities of putting your mining ships in one system in EVE, your combat ships in another, and flying around in between them and whatnot will be dwarfed by Star Citizen. I can tell you this pretty confidently today. When release day happens, you are only going to chase down one of these massive intricate game professions to start with, and it will probably define you for most of the rest of the game. This however is next week's topic. So don't buy ships. No, do. Don't buy them for the launch. Buy them for now. I have zero intention of ever using a prospector when the game goes live, but I own one now. The verse today is quite small, not to say there are not people who do otherwise, but I can't just mine for a week straight. It gets dull and repetitive. I don't particularly enjoy bounty hunting in its current go-kill-that-guy mode, and I'm not super big on dogfighting in Star Citizen anyways. In this point, I also don't need buckets of money. If I spend four hours mining titanium from a scenic moon, what difference does it make in my gameplay experience? Because if I had to make 100k in an hour, I could, but that's not how I would. I don't need to. This is what we have to again circle back to in the future. Today, there is no money sink. After your first 100k earned, there really is no major need to earn money. Yes, if you want to make a meta Banu Defender, you're going to need to show me the money. If you want to maximize that prospector's earning power, it's going to cost you a few hundred thousand UEC to pull off. But in today's verse, time is not money. If you didn't want to do those things, you could buy everything you want and play the game the rest of 2950 without earning any more money. Though you would probably be hard fought to not keep earning money just playing the various game loops we have. Which is why most players in Star Citizen today play as game loop nomads. The biggest source of financial loss is going to prison and paying fine, which not only do half the prison regulars not pay because breaking out and clearing your name is your intended game loop of choice for now, but it's otherwise entirely avoidable. Generally speaking, you can avoid big fines in prison, so fleet management for now is really simple. Buy whatever floats your fancy in the moment. 
I spend more than half my time in Star Citizen running packages not because it's particularly exciting, but because it's a fun way to tour the system in my exploration ship, going different places, seeing different things. This, however, would be a pretty dull video if I left it at that. There are some exceptions to this advice and we're going to cover them, but today it is just not worth buying the big fancy ships. Let's break out some examples to illustrate this all because it's rather nebulous. No pun. First example is the Prowler. If you buy this ship because you need a stealth dropship for release, save your money. Dropships even in the promised future of Star Citizen are potentially still entirely useless. And there is nothing in the Prowler currently that makes it stealth. CAG isn't even sure what that's going to mean yet. A 600i or even a Caterpillar are actually better investments if you want to go clear out FPS bunkers right now. Their shields are powerful enough you could literally park them at the front door, pick off the turrets if you want, or don't even bother, and go in on foot. All for roughly the same cost, though, actually, no, that would save you real money. This isn't to say when the game releases the Prowler is going to be useless, but we just don't have anything that tells us what its use could be to justify spending that kind of money. However, ignoring the nerf it got, if you picked up a Prowler to be an interesting choice for a fighter, that wouldn't have actually been the worst investment. It actually had good stats for a while if you changed out the weapons to have some pretty awesome DPM for clearing out some of those claim jumper missions. It was a sleeper for dealing with PvPers, because stock, it really wasn't something you probably would take into a fight, but it had a great range for the Stanton system currently, and it allowed package running or some exploration with hand-dropped cargo space. Best of all, it looks super cool, and if you melted most of your fleet just to have a Prowler in it, you wouldn't be locked out of a lot of gameplay options. The next example is the Cutlass Red. If you're putting one of these on your dream fleet to provide medical services when the game launches, wait. Again, the details of this game loop are unknowns, but consider that most large military ships already have medical beds planned, following the 890 and Carrick getting them. How could they not? The ambulance need is still entirely devoid because there's no hospital ship concept currently anyhow, and plenty of other ships can transport wounded folks when that gameplay is introduced. Currently. The red is simply the cheapest respawn bed available, which is a fantastic reason to buy it. Like exploring caves, there is not a better ship to take down because if you fall to your death, you can just respawn at the mouth of the cave. Running FPS missions or battle royales with other players? Again, a quality buy. I'll do one more example, the Banu Merchantman. Now you probably didn't think I was going with this after the last two examples because it isn't in the game. The design feels like it keeps changing. The original concept ideas they floated all can't work in the current mentions of its design. It's only twice as long as a caterpillar, but it has 3,584 SC of capacity. It's going to have a bazaar like the newly announced and more exclusive privateer, yet this would cheapen the value of the privateer in the same vein. All of this is actually why it's a solid buy today. The price point. Here's the deal. This is one of those rare early concepts that exploded past what was originally intended for it, because the original Merchie was an alien cat and nothing more. Then it exploded in size, got fancy new ideas, which then percolated into new ideas for other ships like the Privateer. The Merchantman already has the alien tax applied, and has nowhere to go but up. At minimum, you're getting something in the vicinity of 800 to 1000 SCU that also has a bazaar, like the very expensive and harder to get privateer. You're getting that with a very big gun and awesome Escher-esque styling of the Banu. If this ship dropped tomorrow, you would have the best cargo ship in the game currently. As a loner, you get a decent fighter and a good daily driver. Odds are, the Merchant Man is going to grow in size, and will be released on the caliber of the Carrick when it happens. Again, however, the most attractive option here is its price point. This is old CIG pricing at play. You're not going to get a size 9 gun and a 1000 SCU for 350 bucks. You're certainly not going to just get a bazaar for that price. The price will probably close to double for the Merchie on release. And don't be surprised if they become more limited in availability too. These are, after all, from a lore perspective, family heirlooms and not mass produced. Which leads us to the planning part of this because by now you probably think I've contradicted myself handily. The alpha is a long game, and you're going to need to keep an eye on the future, but play for now because next month CIG could announce a complete change to a planned game loop, which could throw off your entire plan. First, let's talk about where to spend your money now. To begin with, don't buy concepts that are not released, especially if they're larger ships like the Nautilus. We don't even have simple drones yet, let alone space mines. 
the core loop of the Nautilus is mine degradation and placement. You have to maintain your minefields, which, until everyone plays in a single instance of the game, renders placed minefields pointless. But, also like the whole D, you won't see this ship enter the verse because it's simply too small currently. The currently owned Nautiluses, if released today, even with the multitude of separate instances of servers, would mine the entirety of visited space in the Stanton system. None of these signs point to your money giving you a playable ship any time in the near future, even if it's past grayboxing, let alone for $750. Put that money in a cat, in a mole, even in a hammerhead. Generally speaking, only buy ships today you can play with, and that you have a need to play with now. I want to take a moment to identify what I mean by need in that statement as well. No one needs a hammerhead for in-game ship-to-ship fighting right now. You don't. However, if you think this is one of the coolest ships out there, get it. There's nothing wrong with owning ships you think are cool. But understand, you're throwing mega bucks away on something that for a while yet will still have no real value or use, and something that on release is intentionally going to be expensive to maintain and operate. Again, however, thinking a ship is super cool is reason enough to get it, so long as you understand it can be absolutely useless. Plenty of angry former citizens didn't grasp this. Thus far, we've covered the first two examples. In those veins, don't worry that you buy a ship now that you don't intend to keep on release, or even up till release. I wanted to do some solo ship mining, so I upgraded to a prospector. Remember, you can always upgrade ships, so if you turned your Aurora into an arrow because you wanted to do bounty missions, that's fine. If later you turn it into a cutty black to give yourself a ton of options, great. Remember, you can't quite go down so easily, but it can be done. The biggest rule here is don't trap yourself thinking that the fleet you have today is even the seeds for the fleet you'll have on release. Allow yourself the freedom of buying ships you like or need now, melting or upgrading them down the road as that changes. This will give you the most play and enjoyment from the verse in an alpha state. But what about that merchant man led? Yes. Keep your eyes out for those ships you might want on the release. I'll talk at length next week about considerations you need to have in that regard, but there's no pressing timetable right now anyways that you'll need to worry about. Don't, however, buy these ships. But, yes, I said buy them, but don't buy them as ships. The Merchantman isn't the worst thing to have in your fleet today because you do get a great loaner. However, substitute other examples like a Polaris and you pretty quickly see the lack of value. Buy CCUs. Here's why this is the way to go. 1. Cost Effectiveness. Assuming they were sold today, you could buy a Merchantman for $40. No, you can't buy one for just $40, but you can buy an Aquila to Merchantman CCU for $40. The price of the Aquila is not going up, which means even when the Merchy soars in price, you're getting yours locked in at $350. What a steal! On top of that, most players could afford to put aside $40. After all, that's less than you probably spent just to buy Star Citizen in general. When do you do this? During the availability sales, Fleet Week or Alien Week, and the annual sale. $40. You can find that between now and then. And unlike spending the $350 now, you get all the benefits of having it, aside from having a loaner for it. 2. Seeds of the Fleet. As a $40 CCU, this can remain unapplied in the back of your hangar. Yes, the Defender looks cool and has a lot of uses, but odds are there are simply plenty of other ships that bring you better value today. If you follow my example earlier, you can take an Aurora and make it an Arrow, then a Cutty Black, then a Prospector, then an Aquila. None of your options here were limited. You could even melt that ship back to an Aurora, turn it into something else with credit on hand in your account for other moves you make. When the Merchantman heads to Evocati, make your move, get yourself to the Aquila, and apply it. Or Continue to wait even until release if it doesn't make sense to have it yet. 3. The easy write-off. Or, maybe when it release comes, CIG murders the Murchie and makes it totally useless for your ideas. Or, you just don't fancy cargo running like you thought. Maybe you joined a different org and now need to drive a concept we haven't even seen yet. Melting a $40 CCU isn't a tough decision. Best of all, you might be able to use this financial improvement. If a Murchie costs $700 when released and you apply it at $350, you now have $700 of value in your hangar. 50 more bucks, and you've got yourself that Nautilus for $400 actually spent. Even the original concept buyers didn't get that deal. Which is why spotting deals like this is worth it now. Sure, there's no guarantee the cost will rise, but you're not going to lose money either. There is a pitfall to pay attention to here, though. 
This was a carefully crafted scenario. The Aquila is always available, and even if CIG changed that, it would be easy to use the gray market to get to one. If you're really worried about this, take a ship you do own and buy a CCU from that to the Aquila. Now melt that CCU. You'll be able to get it back from buyback and secure the safety of that CCU. This too is a pitfall you can go down if you're not careful, but this is always a risk. When you deal in CCUs, always consider the availability and price of your seed ships. Never use a seed like a merchantman that will almost certainly rise in price because you're forcing yourself to spend more than you have to in the long run while forcing yourself to run that route as well. If you were clever, you might have realized you could also melt that $40 Merchie CCU from the example since that too would be in your buyback. CIG has never said they plan to kill buyback, but they could. After all, you're not invested financially into them like you are your hanger. If you really want the Merchie, just hold the $40 in your hanger. So to recap, don't think about Star Citizen as a single game. Think about it as the game we have now and the game we'll have someday. Buy ships that exist today in the game that you want to play with now. Buy CCUs for certain ships you really want when you can get them, but don't apply them till those ships are available and you still want them. Next week we're going to talk about considerations to have when planning your release day fleet, but until then, let marinate that the fleet you have now will almost certainly not be the fleet you still have when the game goes live. The exceptions to this are the guys who own 80% of all the concepts, and they don't need any of this advice anyways, they're just going to buy everything. However, if you're like myself and money isn't growing from trees, you will enjoy the game more if you leave yourself free to buy what you can play with today and take comfort in the back of your head that this is all going to change before the game actually goes live. The Polaris is super cool, the Kraken is an awesome ship, but sink your money into those concepts today and the game loops month after month, patch after patch, and your only other ship, an Aurora, is going to dry up, leaving you salty and no longer a player of Star Citizen despite having in your hangar a rare and coveted concept. Again, tune in next week when we talk about considerations and planning ahead to the fleet you someday want to have so that you don't waste real money. For that, Game of Star Citizen will be radically different than this one, and will require a completely different set of ships. You'll look back to now when you started making smart moves to achieve an enjoyed alpha and a successful launch. Let me know in the comments what ships you think will have the greatest value on launch and why. Like and share this video with your friends, subscribe if you've not, and as always, I will catch you all next time.